The subject of today's video is the exposure triangle, so let's get started. When I took my first photography class back in high school, my teacher, Greg Wall Stevens, who I owe a lot to, taught us everything on a very manual Pentax K1000. He described exposure in fairly simple terms, and over time I've heard this described as the exposure triangle. Like all triangles, the exposure triangle has three sides. But two of the sides have numbers that don't exactly make sense because they don't grow linearly. So in this video, I'm going to go into things in depth and demystify exposure. So the first side of our triangle is going to be the aperture side, or f-stops. These are numbers that describe the opening at the back of the lens that lets light pass through. These numbers don't really make sense and they seem fairly arbitrary, but the smaller the number, the bigger the opening, and the larger the number, the smaller the opening. Full stops, in order from brightest to darkest, goes 2.8, f4, 5.6, f8, f11, f16, f22. Every time you go from one number to the next, you get half the volume of light passing through the lens. Some lenses have f-stops that open up really big, like 1.0. However, these lenses are fairly expensive. Some larger format cameras have lenses that go all the way down to, let's say, f64, and it's a very small opening. But for the most part, the scale of most lenses is going to go basically between, let's say, f4 and f16, maybe somewhere in there. Now your camera will let you set your apertures in full stop increments, half stop increments, or one third stop increments. But one third is the most popular way and it's probably the default for your camera. Now when you take a picture, the aperture that you choose affects the depth of field in your image. And depth of field is just the amount of stuff that's in focus from the front to the back. So if you use a smaller number, which is a bigger opening, you're going to have very minimal depth of field. A lot of times when you're shooting a portrait with let's say an 85 millimeter lens and it's a headshot, you're probably going to end up with just the eyes in focus at around f2.8 and the ears will be mostly blurry. Now if you're shooting a landscape, you wanna use an f-stop like f11 or f16 because that's going to give you the most depth of field and allow you to record the most detail in your image. Now the last thing to keep in mind when selecting an aperture is that your lens is going to be at its sharpest somewhere in the middle of its range, maybe between f4 and f8. If you want to look this number up, there are a lot of websites online that have tested out lenses by shooting pictures of test charts. And they post those images which you can compare from one f-stop to the other to figure out what is best for your lens. The second side of our triangle represents shutter speeds. The shutter speed is the fraction of time in seconds that your sensor is capturing the image. Now these numbers are actually logical. 1 250th of a second is half the time of 1 1 25th of a second, and so on and so forth. While your camera is capable of shutter speeds between these speeds, full f-stops of shutter speeds in order would go something like 1 4,000th of a second, 1 2,000th of a second, 1 1,000th of a second, 1 500th of a second, 1 250th of a second, 1 25th of a second, and 1 60th of a second. Your camera is probably capable of shutter speeds that go from 1 8,000th of a second all the way down to multiple seconds. Now if you're working with a flash in the studio and you're just doing traditional photography, you're not doing high speed sync or anything fancy like that, the maximum shutter speed that you can use with a flash is called the sync speed. And for most cameras, your sync speed is around a 200th of a second. If you exceed this amount, you're gonna end up with black banding at the bottom of your frame because effectively you've told the camera to move faster than it's capable of sending the signal to the flash and having the flash fire correctly. Now the shutter speed determines how your camera captures motion. A slow shutter speed that's let's say below a 60th of a second is not going to freeze a person who's walking. 
or even me right now gesturing with my hands. You're gonna need probably maybe a 200th of a second or a 250th of a second in order to accomplish that. If I were running, you would need a shutter speed that was closer to a 2000th of a second in order to freeze my motion. If I was a ballet dancer, wouldn't that be nice? Jumping through the air, you might need a 4,000th of a second to capture that movement. Now, if you're wondering about using a flash and freezing motion, you need to learn about flash duration. And if you look through my videos on YouTube, there is a separate video explaining this topic. So the last thing to keep in mind when selecting a shutter speed is camera shake. And that's when the natural movement from your hands and body transfers in to the lens and the camera, causing your images to be blurry when they're recorded. So the rule of thumb is one over the focal length of the lens. So for example, if you're using an 85 millimeter lens to shoot a portrait and your shutter speed is slower than one over 85, you're gonna end up with blurry images. Now your camera doesn't have a shutter speed of 1 85th, but it does have a shutter speed of 1 90th. The third side of our exposure triangle is ISO. And ISO is the number that signifies the sensitivity of your camera's sensor to light. The lower your ISO, the higher quality you're gonna get out of your image. If you go up really high with the ISO, you're gonna get noise. So if you zoom into the shadows around 100%, you're gonna see things in there that look like dust. And that's what you want to avoid. So use the lowest ISO that you can to get the exposure that you need. Most cameras begin at 100 ISO and double in sensitivity each time you double the number. So it totally makes sense. So you start with 100, then 200 is twice as sensitive as 100, 400 is twice as sensitive as 200, then there's 800 and 1600 and 3200, and it even goes beyond that. Now your camera might even go lower, 250 ISO, or it might just be called low ISO. Originally when cameras did this, they did so by sort of faking it, by limiting the amount of tones or the range of tones that they could capture. This is called dynamic range. So instead of capturing, let's say, 14 f-stops of dynamic range, they would only capture 13. So look in your manual and discover if that's what your camera does. And if it does that, you should probably avoid 50 or low ISO because you won't get that full range of contrast and light that you would capture at 100. And just like f-stops and shutter speeds, your camera is going to be capable of ISOs that are between those whole numbers that I mentioned earlier probably also in one third and one half stop increments. Regardless of the brightness of our scene or how we have our camera set up, we need the same amount of light to pass through and hit the sensor in order to record an image properly. So let's think about our sensor like a bucket of water that we need to fill to the top. So our aperture is going to be the size of the hose and our shutter speed is going to be the amount of time that we have to leave the faucet on. If we're using a very small aperture, a very narrow hose, we're going to have to leave our shutter open a long time in order to fill up our bucket. If we're using a really big aperture, like 1.4 or something, a big hose, if you will, it's not gonna take long for that light to pass through or the water to pass through and fill up our bucket. In the real world, if I wanna take a photo on a sunny day, my shutter speed is likely to be 1 100th of a second at f16 at 100 ISO. I know this because it's an example of the sunny 16 rule, which states that your exposure on a sunny day will be 1 over your ISO at f16. Just for the sake of argument, let's say that that number is a whole number, 1 125th at f16 at 100 ISO. Now, if you're trying to photograph a person posing outside, 1 1 25th of a second is probably too slow to freeze motion. And this is where Mr. Stevens comes back in. In his classroom, he had a slider with all the shutter speeds on the sliding part, 
and all of the f-stops fixed at the bottom. So if you lined up 1 125th at f16, it would show you all of the possible shutter speeds and aperture combinations at that ISO. Now let's say for whatever reason, we're outside on that sunny day and we wanna shoot at 1 8,000th of a second at 2.8. And as you can see on the chart, the numbers that match up are 1 4,000th of a second at f2.8. The only way we can get to 1 8,000th at 2.8 is to increase our ISO to 200 ISO. Now the reason why we had to increase the ISO from 100 to 200 is because whenever you have a correct exposure, your triangle is in balance. And when you change one of the sides, you have to compensate by changing one of the other two sides to keep it in balance. So our choice was to increase the ISO or to open the aperture up even more from 2.8 to f2. Anyway guys, I hope that made sense. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those below. I hope I did a good job of explaining it, hopefully as well as Mr. Stevens. He was a great teacher and I still look up to him to this day. Uh, if you're watching this on Instagram TV, just know that you can always watch it on YouTube. And if you're watching it on YouTube, please hit subscribe so you can see more videos like this. Thank you guys so much for your time. Have a great day, stay safe, and I will talk to you soon.